welcome back to virology. Today we are going to talk about mechanisms of pathogenesis. What is pathogenesis? It is all the processes that lead to disease. It can be viral pathogenesis, bacterial pathogenesis, any kind of agent. We're going to talk about viral pathogenic pathogenesis today. And so a pathogenic virus causes disease, a non-pathogenic virus does not. And as you will see today, uh, this is often a collateral outcome of the pa parasitic nature of viruses, which means they take something from the host, they damage it, but the host also responds, and that's part of the disease as well. And I just want to emphasize, uh, before we go further, that selection does not select for viruses with increased pathogenicity. It typically selects for viruses which reproduce better or which may spread better from host to host. But increased pathogenesis is not a direct selective property. It may be indirectly selected, but it makes no sense to think about viruses being selected for more pathogenesis unless perhaps... Uh, they reproduce better, so they spread better to another host, and the reproduction at higher levels causes increased pathogenesis. So that's a collateral damage. But we'll come back to that more when we talk about evolution. The way we study pathogenesis is through animal models in the laboratory. And there are many animal models for many different virus infections. And I, about all of them, I have a phrase that goes, mice lie and monkeys exaggerate because no animal model gives you the perfect picture of a human disease. And you should never predict what's going to happen in people from an animal model. This slide summarizes different ways that we can make mouse models for virus diseases. You can modulate the immune response. You can put in clonal T cell receptors. You can immune deplete certain populations like B cells and T cells, as we've shown in some experiments before. You can put human tissues into mice. That's a way of making a mouse model for HIV AIDS. You can produce transgenic mice that have individual viral genes, that have whole viral genomes. You can even put in human receptor genes into mice to try and make them susceptible to infection. Uh, and if none of these work, you can also, some mice can be infected with human viruses. Uh, or in some cases, you have animal viruses that are similar to the human viruses that give you models for infection. So different ways that we can use mice uh, to, to make animal models. There are other animals that can be used, ferrets, hamsters, guinea pigs, non-human primates. They don't have any of the flexibility of mice. Mice can be inbred and bred in large numbers. They're easy to take care of. So all the others are, are much more difficult and have limitations. <clears throat> Here at Columbia in 1990s, in my laboratories, we made the first transgenic animal model for a disease, the mouse model for disease. My student had uh, cloned the gene for the human poliovirus receptor. Kathy Mendelson did that. Uh, and then that, that protein, when it produced in mouse cells, allows those cells to be infected with poliovirus because mouse cells don't have the receptor for the virus. And then another student of mine, Rebel Wren, made a transgenic mouse containing the human poliovirus receptor gene. That mouse expresses the poliovirus receptor in many tissues. And when you infect them with poliovirus, they, they get paralyzed, as you can see here. It's the first transgenic animal model for a virus disease. And since then, many others have been made, of course, more recently, uh, a number of my, mouse models have been produced for COVID-19. This is a slide that summarizes all the available animal models for COVID. The problem here is that mice are not susceptible, right? Mice do not have receptors for SARS-CoV-2. And so what can you do to get around that? Well, you can make ACE2 transgenic mice, of course, ACE2 being the human receptor. So you can make a, a mouse similar to the one I just described to you for poliovirus. You can also make very few amino acid changes in the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, and that enables the spike of SARS-CoV-2 to bind to ACE2, and now the virus will infect mice. Those two amino acid changes were discovered in two different ways. First, by taking SARS-CoV-2, 
SARS-CoV-2 and passing it from mouse to mouse until a virus was isolated that could infect mice. And when the genome of that virus was sequenced, they found two amino acids in spike that were necessary. And then months later, one of the variants of concern had the same changes in it, which just accidentally enabled uh, the virus to infect mice as well. So then we have non-human primates, which you can use, but they're, also, they're very expensive and very, uh, I find it ethically difficult to work with non-human primates, but some people do. They're not necessarily any better than any, mo any other model. We can use ferrets, we can use hamsters, and, and many others as well. So th that's, that's where we get a lot of the information that we have about uh, viral pathogenesis from animal models. The other concept I want you to understand is called tissue tropism. It is the spectrum of tissues infected with a particular virus. Not all viruses infect every tissue in you. Some viruses are restricted, and we call them depending on where they reproduce, like enterotropic in the enteric tract, neurotropic in the nervous system, hepatotropic for the liver, and so forth. And viruses can have very restricted tropism, or they can be pantropic. They can infect many tissues. So what are some of the determinants of tropism? It's interesting to know what they are, because maybe that can tell you about interventions in virus infections. Certainly susceptibility, which means whether or not a receptor is present in a tissue. <clears throat> some receptors are everywhere, and some are not. And even if a receptor is everywhere, the virus doesn't necessarily reproduce in all tissues because you still have to deal with permissivity, right? The internal environment of the cell which determines whether the virus can multiply and that can differ. Accessibility of tissues, many tissues are not accessible to viruses. Immune defenses, many tissues have very good defenses. Others are immunoprivileged and allow viruses to reproduce. So lots of determinants of tissue tropism. Here's an example, glycoprotein cleavage. The influenza virus hemagglutinin, which is shown here on the top, has to be cleaved at this little orange arrowhead in order to expose the fusion peptide. If it's, the HA is not cleaved, the virus will not infect cells. And the protease that does that is largely restricted to the respiratory tract. And that's why influenza, in humans at least, is mainly a respiratory disease. If the virus gets to other tissues, which it could, it won't reproduce because there, no, there is no protease to cleave the HA. So in the respiratory tract here, we see some epithelial cells making influenza virus. On release from the cell, they're cleaved by proteases that can be either soluble or membrane bound. And this is a de major determinant of of tropism of the virus. Now, you may have heard recently about avian influenza H5N1 viruses. These infect birds that can be highly lethal, cause all kinds of problems uh, with, with bird production for farming, for, for, for eating. And these viruses can occasionally infect people, and they can be quite lethal. So the fear is that eventually this virus will change sufficiently to become a pandemic virus, which means transmits very well among people. It hasn't done that yet. The cleavage of this hemagglutinin is different from most others. This hemagglutinin of H5N1 is cleaved by furins. Furins are proteases that are present everywhere in us. They're not just in the respiratory tract. So this uh, feature allows these viruses to reproduce in other organs. And so an H5N1 infection in people can involve many other organs besides just the respiratory tract. And the furin cleavage site, which is in the HA, it's, it's right there at the tip of the fusion peptide, consists of multiple basic amino acids. And you may remember people talking about furin cleavage sites in the context of SARS-CoV-2. And that's actually present in SARS-CoV-2 and allows cleavage of that as well. We'll get back to that another time. So the first question is, insertion of a furin cleavage site in the HA allows influenza virus to infect many organs. This means that the blank of the virus has changed. And you can put in susceptibility of the virus, club cell tryptase of the virus, 
permissivity, tropism, or all of the above. So you're wondering what this club cell tryptase is. That's, that's the protease that cleaves the HA of influenza virus uh, in the respiratory tract. Uh, you guys are like rejuvenated after spring break. You're just reaching that asymptote really faster than you ever have done before. <laughs> Maybe we need a spring break every other week, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, what do we do here? Look at that. 73% got the right answer, tropism. So the insertion of the, the fear and cleavage site has changed the tropism. It's not changed the susceptibility of the virus. Note the wording, the susceptibility. It would be the cells being susceptible, not the virus. Tryptase is not involved. <clears throat> Permissivity is beyond entry, so that's not involved. It's not all of the above. <clears throat> so it's changing the tropism of the virus from just infecting the respiratory tract to infecting many other tissues. So we can, uh, we can study pathogenesis in the laboratory, and one of the things we do is measure what's called viral virulence. So viral virulence is the capacity of a virus to cause disease in a host, and we can measure it. And we talk about virulent viruses that cause disease and avirulent or attenuated viruses that do not cause disease. And we, ha we make attenuated vaccines that we give to people so they get immunized against viruses. They don't cause disease. They're not virulent. We can quantitate virulence. There are lots of assays that you can use depending on the virus and the animal that you're studying. We can measure simply virus titer as a surrogate for virulence. We can measure how long it takes the animal to die, appearance of signs, right, not symptoms, because symptoms are what you would tell someone, I have a stomach ache, so the mice can't do that. So mice only have signs, measurement of fever, measurement of weight loss, measurement of pathological lesions. So poliovirus causes lesions in the spinal cord, which you can see under a microscope, reduction in the CD4 positive lymphocytes in the blood by HIV, you can easily measure those. These are all ways of uh, measuring virulence of a virus. So remember that many signs and symptoms of disease are caused by the immune response. So when you measure virulence, you're not really measuring just the virus, you're also measuring the host response, and that can differ depending on what you're using, whether what, what kind of animal it is. So what's the difference between pathogenicity and virulence? So pathogenicity is the ability to be pathogenic, right? Is it a pathogenic virus or a non-pathogenic virus? It is a qualitative term. It's yes or no. A virus is pathogenic or it's not pathogenic. There's no measuring it. Virulence is the disease-producing power of a, of a virus, and it's a way of measuring pathogenicity. So we have assays for virulence, as I've just shown you. You can talk about different degrees of virulence, depending on how much weight is lost and so forth. And that's a way of quantifying pathogenicity. So they're, they're very related, but one is all or none and one is quantitative. So here's an example of measuring viral virulence in two ways. So on panel A, we are infecting mice with two different types of poliovirus, type one and type two. There are three types of poliovirus. And these are mice infected with type one or two, and they're transgenic mice with poliovirus receptor. And you can see what this is. This is called a Kaplan-Meier curve, which is simply a fancy name for plotting survival with time. And so we have days post-infection on the x-axis, number of survivors on the y. And you can see that type 1, in 15 days, none of the mice die. They're all surviving. And with type 2, they're all dead by day 11, I suppose. Okay, so that's a very straightforward assay for virulence. Uh, you, can, you could do, you know, the time it takes to kill 50% of survivors. Use that as a, as a metric for measuring virulence. On the right is, is a slightly different assay, panel B. Now what we are doing is we're, we have five different viruses, and we're infecting mice, and we're asking, does the virus cause lesions in the central nervous system? And those three different bars, the C, B, and S, are cerebellum, cerebrum, brainstem, and spinal cord. So you infect the mice, you take out 
the, the nerv nervous tissues and you slice them, you look at them under a microscope and you say, what is the lesion score? You give it a lesion score that you've established. And you can see high lesion scores for some of these viruses in all tissues like Japanese encephalitis virus can it cause lesions everywhere. Yellow fever, slightly less. And look at, uh, so dengue is not really neurotropic. It doesn't cause any neurovirulence, doesn't cause any neural disease. And Langat is interesting because it causes more lesions in the spinal cord than in the cerebrum. So another way of assaying virulence, and it also shows you that different viruses can do different things in different parts of the central nervous system. Virulence is a relative property. It is not an absolute property, which you may have understood from our discussion about asymptomatic infections. It is influenced by many parameters. The dose of virus you give, how you give it the root of infection, the species you're using, the age of the species, the sex, the susceptibility of the host. So you can't compare virulence, first of all, of different viruses because they're different viruses and they're going to behave differently in different animals. And if you want to compare, say, two different polio viruses, like I showed you being compared, um, you have to do the same assay, the same amount of virus, the same route of inoculation in the same animal host. Uh, now, you may say, what about those different viruses? They're all Flavy viruses, so you can compare typically viruses within the same family, that panel B there. So this is why it's very difficult to make conclusions about virus virulence in humans. The only way you can make a definitive assessment whether the original SARS-CoV-2 is any less virulent than, say, Delta, would be to do challenge studies. And that's not ethical for the most part. You can't just give people viruses, especially if you don't know what's going to happen, if, if they might die. One challenge study has been done with SARS-CoV-2 in the UK, and, which I think was a big mistake, but they used 30 or 40 young, quote, young, healthy people. So I think that's a misnomer in itself because, well, being young, you know that by their age. But healthy, how do you know there's not some underlying genetic defect in those people? You have no idea. And you don't know if any of them are going to develop long COVID. In fact, one of the, one of the individuals uh, never recovered their sense of taste and smell. So I don't think that's ethical, even if they agree to do it. Nevertheless, that's the way you would measure virulence in people. You can't make just observational studies. What is an observational study? I'll get to that in a moment. So here's an example of how virulence depends on the route of inoculation. This is a virus, uh, LCMV, of, of uh, rodents. Um, it can be in a hamster that you buy at the pet store. And most of you will have no problem being infected with this, but if you're immunosuppressed, it could kill you. And it has killed some people. So here we inoculate mice by two routes. Intraperitoneally, we put the virus into the gut. And if you put 100,000 PFU of virus, all the mice survive, no problem. But if you put one PFU right into the brain, intracranially, they're all dead. So the route of inoculation makes a big difference. And so um, why is that? Well, probably the virus has trouble getting from the peritoneal cavity to the brain. Brain is the final place where it's going to do its damage. So in people, you have to make sure everyone gets the same dose, the same route of infection, and that's very hard to do. So here's an example of a paper. It's a preprint that, was, that came out um, sometime last year or the year before. Progressive increase in virulence of novel SARS-CoV-2 variants in Ontario, Canada. So what they did here, the, the hospital is admitting people over time for COVID. And as the variants change, they decided to tally up the numbers on who was admitted and how serious their disease was, all right? And so they're saying there's a progressive increase in virulence. I say this is wrong. And in fact, other hospitals had different observations. And op this is an observational study where you just say, we had 100 people coming in the hospital. How many of them had, were COVID and how many of them were not? The assumption is coming in the hospital is a problem. And so that is your gauge of virulence. And that's wrong. Because first of all, people come, do people come to the hospital with COVID or for COVID? When it, during the pandemic, everyone who went to the hospital for any procedure got a COVID test and they would be in the COVID positive population. So if you come in for a heart valve replacement, you're COVID positive, but that shouldn't play into whether you 
think the virus is more virulent or not because you didn't go because you were sick from COVID. So observations in hospitals don't cut it in terms of measuring viral virulence. And I can show you studies in hospitals that look at Omicron. Some of them say it's more virulent. Some of them say it's less virulent. Why? Because there are always confounding factors that come into play when you do those kinds of studies. Here's a paper where they looked at vir pathogenicity. Not really the right word because they quantified it in this paper. It should be virulence, but okay. Probably never took a virology course of Omicron in hamsters. And they compared it to the original SARS-CoV-2, the first one that came out in the, in the end of 2019. And they said it caused less disease. They had various ways of quantifying disease in hamsters. And it seemed to be less virulent. If you look at the data, it does look less virulent than hamsters. But I can show you studies which say it's not less virulent in hamsters. So again, I'm not sure what the animal models mean. But look at the statement they make at the end of the paper. The attenuated pathogenicity of Omicron might be considered good news for humans, right? However, Omicron spreads more rapidly. It appears to be resistant to vaccine-induced immunity. Therefore, we cannot conclude that the risk of Omicron for global health is relatively low. That's a fair statement. But they didn't go far enough. They should have said, we have no idea what measuring it in hamsters means. Of course, they don't want to say that because then they won't get funded for their work. You see the problem in science that we have, right? You have to support your own work. Yeah. Fusogenicity, um, when you infect cells with SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses, the, the glycoproteins are displayed on the plasma membrane. And then neighboring cells can fuse with each other because the, the spike will bind a receptor on the next cell. We, we called it syncytium formation a long time ago. Okay. Anyway, so human virulence determinations are, in my opinion, all bogus. You really can't make them. But what we do is we work in the laboratory in animal models to try and understand what makes a virus virulent, what virus and host genes are involved. And what we do is we make mutations in the virus, and then we infect animals, which is something you cannot do in people. And so... For example, here we have an experiment where we're putting virus intracerebrally into mice. You have a wild type virus that grows really well in cells and culture. That's a plaque assay, those red dots. And you put it in the brain of the mouse. It's neurovirulent, which means it causes some kind of neurological disease, usually paralysis, but it can be something else. Now we make a mutation in the viral genome. And that mutation really knocks down the ability of the virus to reproduce. You get fewer plaques and they're smaller. You put that virus in mice, it doesn't cause disease. I would say this is an uninteresting mutation because all you're doing is inhibiting the, the virus's reproduction. It doesn't tell you anything about a specific gene needed for virulence. However, the third virus is very interesting because you make a mutation in a gene and the virus grows well in cell culture, and then in mice, it's attenuated. So now you have a gene that's specifically involved in virulence. So it's not so much involved in reproduction in cells in culture, but it seems to be involved in virulence. That's an interesting gene, not just a growth defect gene. So over many years, people have done that sort of experiment with many viruses and animal models. And the virulence genes can be put into four categories. There are some that affect virus replication, as I've told you, not so interesting. Some, some genes encode toxins. There are some viral toxins, not a lot, but that, those are interesting. Uh, some of them, many of them, are genes that encode modifiers of host defenses, right? We've talked about how at every level of host defense, there has to be some kind of viral antagonism. And if you take away that gene, then the virus has a problem uh, multiplying, makes it attenuated or, or reduced pathogenicity. And then there are genes that um, uh, enable the virus to spread in the host from one place to another. These last two classes, they have no effect on reproduction in cell culture. Um, in fact, the last three classes have no impact on virus reproduction. And people often call them non-essential genes which is not a good name because they're there to, to do something in an animal, and so they're not non-essential. They're non-essential maybe in cell culture, but in an animal they are. So here are some examples of 
virulence genes. Here is one that's a non-coding mutation. It does, virulence uh, genes don't have to code for proteins, so we shouldn't call them genes. Virulence determinants, there you go, <laughs> need not encode proteins. So in many parts of the world, we use the Sabin oral poliovirus vaccines to immunize people uh, to protect them against polio. And these vaccine strains have mutations in the five prime non-coding region that make them unable to cause disease. And remember, the five prime non-coding region, about 740 bases, highly structured, it's RNA, highly structured RNA. And this stem loop five there, blown up on the right, has single base changes for each of the three serotypes of the Sabin vaccines, which make them not pathogenic, type one, type two, and type three, single base changes. So we don't know how these work actually to this day, but a single base change in a non-coding region is enough to make a virus not be pathogenic. We used to study this, uh, these changes in my laboratory years ago, and here's an experiment where we took two polioviruses, which differ only at, at one base, 472, which is right here in the five prime non-coding region. And that is the base that is changed in the type three Sabin vaccine. If you have a, a U at that position, that's the base in the polio vaccine. And you put this virus intracerebrally into mice, uh, none of them ever get paralyzed. So we're looking at a 50% lethal dose here. You can put 10 to the seventh PFU IC and the mice are fine with a U at 472. If you have virus with a C at 472, then 9,000 PFU will paralyze half of the mice. So showing that this one base change makes a big difference. Why is that vaccine not widely used for polio? It is, actually. It's, used in, it's not used in the US, it's not used in Europe, but it's used in countries that, uh, where the vaccination campaigns are run by WHO. So it's used throughout Africa, it's used in many countries in Asia. Um, it, it, because it's easy, you can just give it by mouth, you don't have to have a needle, and it's very cheap. Yeah. It has problems though, which we will talk about when we talk about vaccines. Um, so one base change makes a big difference. You see the virus with a C replicates quite nicely, and, it, and as I said, it paralyzes the mice. The virus with a U is cleared uh, after infection. <coughs> All right. uh, then there are the, the gene products that modify host defenses, which we've talked about before in our two immune lectures. Immune modulators of intrinsic defenses, uh, innate defenses, adaptive defenses, and these are genes not needed for replication in cell culture because there's usually no immune defenses there, and so taking them out doesn't make a difference. Here's an example of an immune defense gene and how it looks like in a virulence assay. This is a virus called gamma herpes virus 68. This is a herpes virus of mice that people use as a model for understanding herpes viruses. When you infect mice, uh, you get a lethal uh, infection. And so what we're looking at here is the percent survival of mice with increasing doses of virus. And so the wild type virus in blue, you can see that 50% survival you get with about five PFU of virus, right? So five PFU into the mice kills half of them. Now you take out a gene the M3 gene that encodes a chemokine receptor, a soluble chemokine receptor. So the virus infected cell makes these and the soluble chemokine receptors go out of the cell and they bind the chemokines that the host is making and so therefore it dampens the immune response. If you take out that chemokine receptor gene, that virus is shown in green. You can see that it's much less lethal. You need now let's say uh, 100 PFU to kill 50% of the mice as opposed to five. So taking out that defense gene makes the virus less pathogenic, that antagonism gene. Then there are toxins that are made by some viruses. If you ever had rotavirus <clears throat> diarrhea, <clears throat> which you would know, <clears throat> it's kind of similar to norovirus, which has been going around this winter. You, uh, you have vomiting and diarrhea for a few days. You don't really forget that kind of infection. Anyway, these viruses make a, a, a toxin called NSP4. It's produced in infected cells. In the gut tract, which is where these viruses reproduce, it inhibits a sodium glucose luminal co-transporter. This is a, a 
transporter protein in the membrane of the cell that's important for keeping fluid balances in check in the intestine. So the basic, the, the result of it inhibiting that is you get diarrhea. The fluid flows out, it's not retained in the cells and you have diarrhea. And there's also <clears throat> an effect on calcium levels of that NSP4 protein that increases ca intracellular calcium, which also leads to release of uh, water from the cells and diarrhea. And so those are a couple of examples of virulence determinants. And so our next question is, which statement about viral virulence is wrong? It can be influenced by dose, route of infection, species, age, sex, and susceptibility of host. It can be quantitated by measurement of fever. Ebola virus is more virulent than human papillomavirus. It's the capacity of a virus to cause disease in the host. When comparing virulence, the assays must be the same. So which, which statement is wrong? All right, how did we answer this one? Uh, yes, the wrong answer is Ebola is more virulent than human papillomavirus. You can't compare different viruses. These are two different families. They're just completely different genomes, different proteins. It's not fair to compare them. You're using different animal models, roots of inoculation. Uh, that's what's wrong. Uh, virulence can certainly be quantitated by measurement of fever. It is the capacity of a virus to cause disease and the host, and you have to have the same assays when comparing virulence. So we've, we've talked about viral virulence genes so far. Let's talk about cellular virulence determinants, because remember, virulence of a virus, its pathogenicity is always a combination of what the virus does and what the host does. So here's an example. We haven't talked about herpes simplex infections yet. We will next week. But essentially, when you get a herpes simplex virus infection, most of the infections are benign. You get them at a young age, uh, and then the virus goes latent in you, so you have it forever. And it's periodically reactivated, and you get a cold sore, or maybe you don't get anything. But a very few people, one in 250,000 people, get herpes encephalitis. The virus comes out of your trigeminal ganglia, which are right on either side of your cheeks here. It goes, usually it goes to your lip, but sometimes it can go up into your brain. And so that's what that shows there, the, from the peripheral nervous system, oops, from the peripheral nervous system to the brain. So these can be fatal. These, these are very serious. In fact, whenever there's a virus in your brain, it's not a good thing because if it doesn't kill you, you often are never the same. 70% mortality if untreated. So there are two peaks of incidence of herpes encephalitis, six months to three years of age, which is when you first get your herpes infection from your parents, and then over 50 years of age when we're seeing reactivation from latency. So people have done studies to understand what is doing this in the host. So what you do is you can take people who have had herpes simplex encephalitis and survived, obviously, and then sequence their genome their, their genome, not the virus, their genome, and then compare them to people who have had herpes and not had herpes simplex encephalitis. And you do what's called a genome-wide association study, GWAS, and you look for single nucleotide changes, which are called SNPs. They're not called mutations, because who's to say what changes a mutation? What is wild type when everybody is different, right? They're just polymorphisms. So that's a really important thing. People are not, they're not mutants, they're polymorphisms. Anyway, you can identify changes. I put mutations there. This is not right. It should be polymorphisms in these genes, TLR3, UNC93B, TRIF, or TRAF. These are all involved in innate sensing of infection. So herpes simplex infections are sensed by toll-like receptor 3, and these other proteins like TRIF is involved in the signaling leading to the induction of cytokines. UNC93B is involved in the transport of TLR3 to the um, endosome and so forth. So all of these proteins make sense. Changes in them, amino acid changes in them, predispose you to herpes simplex encephalitis. So, you know, someday when all of our genomes are sequenced at birth, you'll see, hey, my kid has TLR3 change, which could lead to severe herpes. So you just be on the lookout. You know, if they get herpes, then you better be ready to treat them because there are antivirals that can be used. So obviously this has been done for COVID because 1% of people who get infected with COVID, roughly 1% die 
And the risk of death doubles every five years from childhood onwards. Okay, so age is obviously a great, the biggest risk factor. And it's, uh, it's, it's one and a half times greater in men than women as well. So they did GWAS between people who get severe COVID and, and get mild COVID. They say, what are the SNPs? So it turns out that um, there are a number of, of uh, changes that are associated with severe COVID. One is this chromosomal region 3P21.31. It's just a name for a specific chromosome and a specific part of it. It turns out we got this part of our genome from Neanderthals because we bred with them and we have incorporated some of their genes. How do we know this? Because we sequenced the Neanderthal genome and we could see bits of it in our genome. Six genes we got from Neanderthals are a risk factor for severe COVID. Um, uh, and people are trying to figure out what they're doing. There are also five other genome-wide regions identified in people with severe COVID. One is, again, from a Neanderthal. It encodes ISGs, interferon-stimulated genes. So maybe they don't work as well, and so that's why you get severe COVID. A second includes the type 2 interferon receptor. So again, maybe compromises your innate responses. A third encodes a protein called TIC2, which is a kinase involved in interferon signaling. So all of these changes in people with severe COVID presumably affect the innate response. So it turns out that the innate response is really important for determining whether you're gonna go on to severe COVID or not. Now on the left of that slide uh, is a graph looking at um, uh, age versus two, two different parameters, inborn errors of immunity. So these are SNPs in immune genes like we've just been talking about. And that, that doesn't change with age. You can see that's the blue line, IEI, that doesn't change. Um, and what does change with age is the prevalence of autoantibodies. So as you get older, a larger fraction of older people have antibodies to their own proteins, including interferons. And in fact, that is the big risk factor for uh, severe COVID, making antibodies to your own interferon, which of course is gonna make a problem because the virus gets in you. You have antibodies to your interferon, so it can't work properly and you get uh, out of control uh, replication. So you look at, uh, so the, there's a code here. So inborn errors of immunity is blue dots. You can see children, adults, and older individuals. It doesn't go up in frequency. Uh, autoantibodies goes up comparing children to adults to older individuals. You see many more autoantibodies in uh, older individuals. Uh, and then the, there are a lot of people with unknown risk. Those are the gray dots. Uh, we don't know what's causing that, but obviously it's uh, age dependent. Uh, as well. So uh, age is the biggest risk factor and having a poor innate immune response. Here's another example of a host gene that's involved in determining virulence, and this encodes CCR5, which is one of the HIV co-receptors. Right? There are two receptors for HIV, CD4 and CCR5, and 4, four to 16 percent of people of European descent have a deletion of this gene. You don't make CCR5. Uh, and so um, many years ago, a German patient who had both leukemia and AIDS was given a stem cell transplant by his physician. And his physician read the literature and saw that CCR5 was a co-receptor for HIV. So he found a donor that was compatible for this guy that was CCR5 deleted, this CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. So you can find them easily enough, 16% of people in Europe. And his, his leukemia was cured and his AIDS was cured. So a stem cell transplant is when they irradiate you, destroy your bone marrow, and then they give you back stem cells from a donor. And they have to, obviously have to be compatible with you, otherwise they'll be rejected. So his, his bone marrow cells were all destroyed. He was given them from a donor who doesn't have CCR5. So now all of his lymphocytes are CCR5 null, so they can't be infected with HIV-1. That's why uh, he was cured of HIV. And then since then, four other patients have been cured using this protocol. Unfortunately, it's too expensive to treat everyone. It's very expensive, and it has a lethality associated with it. But it tells you that if you can target CCR5, which you could do with, say, CRISPR, uh, you can uh, cure HIV AIDS, and we'll talk about that later. Okay, so that's a cellular determinant. It's a receptor for a virus. That's pretty straightforward. What else do we have? Well, 
uh, there are other determinants like age. Very young and very old people are, are the most susceptible to disease. There's a graph of influenza deaths from 1911 to 1915. You can see the most deaths are in the young and the very old. Why is that? Well, when you're young, you have an immature immune response. When you're old, well, you have a lot of problems. You have, <laughs> your, your muscles are not as good, so your respiratory muscles are weaker. You have less elastic alveoli. Your cough reflex is diminished, and your bone marrow diminishes with age, so you have a lot of trouble making memory responses. So as I said before, or maybe I said this to another class, we're designed to survive through reproductive age. And after that, nothing else matters. The evolution of animals is enough to get them to, to have offspring. And for us, that's past our 30s. And anything beyond that, as far as I'm concerned, is gravy because you're not designed to grow much older. Yet we have ways of getting older. And uh, this is one of the consequences, we get severe infectious diseases. So here's the COVID case fatality ratio by age. Um, we, you can see the, the bars are different countries. I, I've only picked a few countries here, South Korea, Spain, China, and Italy. And you can see it goes up enormously with age. As I said, it goes up what, fivefold every five years or so. And this is typically due to the interferon response and other factors that we don't know about. What else? Uh, in general, males are slightly more susceptible to viral infections than females. Females are protected by a good immune response because they are the key reproductive members of the species. So you can study this when you immunize people f with vaccines. You can then say, how do the two sexes do in terms of antibody responses? So that's what this graph is here. This is neutralizing antibody seroconversion rate after giving people influenza vaccine. And so adult males make a lower response than adult females. But if you look at aged males and aged females, they're the same. So the females have now gone past reproductive age. They are no longer biologically make a better immune response because it's not needed. And so this elevated uh, immunity, I say, is, is phylogenetically conserved. We see it in other animals as well besides humans. Uh, but it's not always the case that females are better protected in, in, when Females are pregnant, they're typically immunosuppressed. Hep A, B, E, influenza, COVID, they're all more lethal in the immunosuppressed state. Other determinants of virulence, malnutrition is a big one in countries where kids are not fed well. Measles is 300 times more, more lethal. Cigarette smoking is another determinant of increasing respiratory disease, right? It's not a viral determinant, it's a host determinant. Air pollution and even stress will increase susceptibility uh, to infectious diseases. All right, the, the last question is, which statement about determinants of viral virulence is, is incorrect? Uh, virulence genes can encode viral proteins. Virulence genes can encode cellular proteins. They are the same in all viruses. They can be found in untranslated regions. They may encode immune modulators, which is wrong. All right, how did we do? Most of you got there. The same in all viruses. That's wrong. They're not, right? Every virus can be slightly different. And all the others are right. They can encode viral proteins. That's right. They can encode cellular proteins. I'll give you examples of both. They can be untranslated regions, and they can encode immune modulators for sure. That's a big one. How, how do you actually get the disease symptoms, right? Not just the flu-like symptoms, because I told you that's interferon-based. But what about... You know, the rash of measles. What about the lesions of polio? What causes that? Let's explore that. So first, there's what the virus does. And that's pretty straightforward. Many viruses kill cells, right? It's, they do so in culture. We call these cytopathic viruses. They induce apoptosis, necrosis, pyroptosis. These are programmed cell death mechanisms. So the cells die. Some viruses encode what we call viral purins. They punch holes in the cell membrane and all the contents spill out. That kills the cell. Viruses inhibit host protein synthesis, RNA synthesis, the membrane uh, starts to get leaky, the cytoplasm degrades. Some viruses cause fusion, syncytium formation by envelope viruses as shown here. So the cytopathic effects of viruses can all play a role in the disease symptoms. So. If poliovirus lyses cells in culture, it's very likely it's doing something similar in neurons in an animal, 
and that causes the paralysis. I mean, you, you'd really need to show that experimentally, and, and actually no one has, but that's the assumption. But most of these signs and symptoms of a virus infection are caused by your host response. This is called immunopathology, or too much of a good thing, right? Because the immune response is good for you, right? But if you have too much, it's not. So it's a very delicate balance. So the clinical signs of, and symptoms of a disease, fever, tissue damage, aches, pains, nausea, are mostly caused by the host response. The flu-like symptoms, the interferons do some of that. But even beyond that, as I'll show you, uh, the immune response does other things as well. And some viruses do not kill cells in culture. We call them non-cytopathic. So their, their symptoms and signs in a host must all be immune response generated because they're not able to cause any damage to cells. So let's look at some examples of immunopathology. So here we have examples of adaptive immunopathologies, right? Antibodies and B cells. There are also uh, consequences of innate over responses. We'll, we'll look at that. Co severe COVID is an innate over response. So we have uh, immunopathologies caused by T cells, both subsets, CD8 and CD4 positive T cells, and those are the different viruses that have immunopathology caused by these. In fact, for CD4s, you can have Th1 or Th2 and probably other Th subsets involved in immunopathologies. And then we can have immunopathology mediated by antibody. So we call that B cell mediated because of course the B cells uh, make the antibodies. So let's take a look at some of these. So here's an example of a viral disease that's caused by CD8 positive T cells, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which kill infected cells. So here we're using a mouse model. We infect mice with LCMV, and within eight days, they have a lethal brain infection. They die. If you infect them and then immunosuppress them with, say, steroids, they live and have a persistent infection, so the virus doesn't kill them. But then if you give them CD8 positive T cells from a mouse that had been, uh, that had been immunized with the virus. So they're virus specific CD8 positive T cells, then the mice die. So this shows you that it's the CD8 positive T cells that's causing uh, lethal disease. So how does this work? Well, here, here are some examples of how that works. This is, this is again LCMV. Uh, on the top two panels, LCMV infection of mice. So there is percent of survival on the top left panel. And we're infecting wild type mice with uh, LCMV. That's the dark curve. You can see in 10 days, mo all the mice are dead. Now we can then take mice where we have knocked out the gene for perforin. Perforin is a protein that is delivered to infected cells by the CD8 CTLs to kill them. CD8 CTLs kill infected cells by releasing perforins. It pokes holes in the membrane and the cell die. Look, in mice lacking perforin, the infection is not lethal. So that means that the perforin response, the CTL response, as I just showed you, is what is killing the mice. It's really remarkable, right? Of course, this is a model where we're putting virus right in the brain, so it's somewhat exaggerated, but it, the principle is that the immune response can be lethal. Uh, on the right is a, a similar experiment, except we're measuring the level of a, of a liver enzyme in the blood. So in general, liver enzymes should be in the liver. They shouldn't be in the blood. If you have a virus infection of the liver, that will let the, the, the enzymes out because cells are dying in the liver, and you can measure them in the blood. So here, if you infect mice, well-type mice with LCMV, you can see at about day five, you have an increase in this GLDH liver enzyme in the serum. It shouldn't be there. As you can see, normally it's low. But in perforin knockout mice, you don't get liver damage. So another example of how CD8-positive T cells are damaging infected cells. And finally, on the bottom is another virus, this is a Coxsackie virus. It's an enterovirus that causes a heart infection in mice and also in humans. Turns out that when you need a heart transplant, it's typically because you've had a long-term Coxsackie virus infection of the heart muscle. It's destroyed, and by the time 
you have the symptoms that tell us you need a heart transplant, it's too, it's too late to do anything about the infection. So there's a mouse model for studying this. And on the left is a section of heart tissue from a mouse that was infected with this Coxsackie B virus. And all of this pink staining is tissue damage caused uh, by, well, by infection, but it's an immune response because if you, this is wild type mice on the left. On the right are perforin knockout mice infected with Coxsackie virus B. There's no pathology. So again, the CD8 T cells are causing the tissue damage. So somehow we have to be able to use this information uh, to prevent heart damage caused by this virus. So that's CD8. CD4 T cells can also cause immunopathology. These make a lot of cytokines. They're helper T cells. That's what they're doing. They recruit other cells like neutrophils, mononuclear cells, and they can cause tissue damage on their own. Uh, and so that the immunopathology that we see associated with these cells is caused by proteases, reactive radicals that are released, cytokines like tumor necrosis factor. They're released by cells that are recruited by CD4 lymphocytes, these helper cells. So let me give you an example of that. There's a blindness caused by herpes uh, simplex virus infections of the eye. It's called herpes stromal keratitis. Common cause of blindness in developed countries. Almost completely immunopathological. And that's what you get after repeated infections. Your, your cornea becomes opaque as a consequence of the immunopathological reactions I'm going to tell you about and you cannot see. So this happens after multiple infections. And, and what, what happens is the virus reproduces in the corneal epithelium. So there's a layer of cells on top of your cornea, the thin layer, the epithelial layer, and then underneath is the corneal stroma, the actual tissue of the cornea. The virus replication is restricted to the epithelium. So this is a section on the top, two different magnifications uh, of the cornea. You can see the corneal epithelium at the top. It's that stained layer of columnar cells. And the virus infects only those cells. Uh, these infected cells secrete cytokines, of course, because the cells are sensing infection. The cytokines recruit CD4 TH1 cells. They secrete cytokines that recruit neutrophils. And the neutrophils go not just to the epithelium, but they also go to the underlying corneal stroma. And these are all neutrophils staining dark here in the corneal stroma. They cause, they secrete a lot of what we call inflammatory mediators, chemokines and cytokines that damage the corneum. So the virus is not even reproducing in the, in the corneum. It's just the corneum. It's just the mediators produced by the immune response by cells recruited by CD4 cells that's causing the damage. Completely immunopathological blindness. Uh, many viruses make rashes on you. We've seen that before. Uh, measles, smallpox, varicella, zoster. These are typically immunopathological reactions. The, the cells in your skin are infected by the virus, and then you have T cells, you have macrophages that are coming there to try and clear the infection. They produce cytokines. Those cytokines cause inflammation. They increase capillary permeability. They cause T cells to come in, and that gives you the rash. So it is a combination of the virus being there and of your immune response uh, going after it as well. All right, so those are CD8 and CD4 mediated immunopathologies, just an example of them. Here is a B cell mediated uh, immunopathology. It's a disease called dengue or break bone fever because when you get it, you have terrible pains in your joints. Um, it is endemic in the Caribbean, Central and South America, Africa, Southeast Asia. Billions of people are at risk for infection because the, vec the, vi the mosquito that spreads it, Aedes aegypti, is present in those areas. That's, that's Aedes aegypti up there. And we have about 400 million reported infections uh, a year. There is actually a Cambodian rock group called Dengue Fever. That's their CD. I was visiting Vanderbilt many years ago, and I went to the radio station. You know, they have all the CDs and shelves. And when I walked in, and I see this dengue fever CD. So the guy was going to interview me. I said, you have to play it during um, 
after my interview, and he did. So this is endemic in that part of the world, Cambodia for sure. All right, so why is this immunopathological? So first of all, <laughs> this, uh, this is the range of, of dengue virus, because, and it matches the, the range of uh, Aedes aegypti. So there on the top are, the dots are confirmed cases of dengue, and these colors are the areas where um, Aedes aegypti are present. By the way, we almost eradicated Aedes aegypti from South America prior to 1981, there was no Aedes aegypti in South America. That's because we used uh, DDT. And then we realized that we shouldn't be using DDT, so we stopped, and then all the Aedes aegypti came back. So now they're all there. And how do they get back from the used tire trade? Come back from other parts of the world where they were uh, present. All right, so that's the range of dengue. So the first time you get it, you get, uh, you, the mosquito bites you, delivers the virus to you, you, get a, you can get an asymptomatic infection or a febrile illness, headache, back and limb pain, rash severe aches and pains in the bones. Most people recover. There's a very slight incidence of hemorrhagic fever, which is where the, your capillaries are breaking and you're bleeding out and um, you can die of that. But that's in one in 14,000 cases. You can get shock from internal bleeding. But most people recover and you make antibodies. There are four serotypes of this virus. And so uh, you get infected, say, with dengue one, you are gonna be protected against dengue one, but not two or three. That's what a serotype means. So what happens is when you get infected again by a different serotype, that is where you have a problem. And that's where you can get hemorrhagic fever and shock at a much higher rate, one in 90 and one in 50 infections. And the reason is when you get infected, let's say you've been infected with serotype one and then you get infected later with type two, you make a memory response to type one. But that, those antibodies that are produced uh, do not neutralize the dengue type 2. They are made against dengue type 1. You have a memory response to dengue 1. Those antibodies will bind dengue 2. That's the secondary infection here. They will not block infection of cells, but what they will do is the antibodies will bind to FC receptors on, say, macrophages. The virus will get in, it'll reproduce in macrophages. So now this is a new cell type for the virus to reproduce in. So you get much more virus produced. And the macrophages make lots of cytokines, which is where you get this hemorrhagic fever and shock. So it's an antibody-mediated disease, and second and third and fourth infections are, are the most uh, severe. Now, we do have a vaccine that's been developed uh, against this, and we'll talk about that later. COVID is also potentially a, um, a cytokine-mediated disease in some people. Here's the time course of, of COVID. So uh, let's start on the left. So you get exposed. That's TE is the time of exposure. And then there's an incubation period before which time you become PCR positive. You know, at, at the incubation is 2 to 14 days. That's before onset of symptoms. But at some point, you start to be uh, RNA positive. The RNA genome numbers rise. And then at the peak of, of genome production, as detected by PV, PCR, that's the onset of symptoms. So that incubation period, 2 to 14 days. Uh, and then in most people, the viral replication declines and in about two weeks, it's over. But, you know, in about 1% of people, well, 1% of people go on to die, but a greater number go on to have more severe conditions. They enter what we call the inflammatory phase. <clears throat> That's the time when you're making now antibodies to the virus, and you can have in this phase, this is where you have trouble breathing, your oxygen saturation drops, you go to the hospital, you may be admitted to the ICU, you may be given high flow oxygen, so you're having the virus enter the lung, reproducing there, and causing an inflammatory response that is over-exuberant. So what is, we think is happening in most of these cases, you don't have an initial good interferon response. The virus begins to reproduce at high levels. It enters the lower tract, and then you have an overreactive inflammatory response that is causing that severe disease. And so to treat that, you use immunosuppressive therapies in this inflammatory phase. You can use steroids or other specific uh, immunosuppressants. But if you try and use an antiviral, 
in this inflammatory period, it's completely useless because the virus is not what's driving uh, your infection any longer your, or your pathology uh, any longer yet. You know, early in COVID, many remdesivir was only tested in hospitalized people and it didn't work and people dismissed it, but then it was tried in people who had just tested positive and it works very well to keep you from getting in the hospital. So you need to understand what is going on uh, in your disease. And finally, immunosuppression is another feature of a, of a virus infection. And that means a virus infects you and it reduces your immune response. And how does that happen? Well, the virus can reproduce in cells of the immune system. It can re reproduce in T or B cells or dendritic cells or macrophages. It can disturb cytokine production. It can disturb the intracellular signaling that's need for cytokine production. And many viruses produce antagonists like Viroceptors or virokines that suppress the immune response. So let me give you uh, some examples here. There are three examples. Measles is a, is a master at immunosuppression. It infects monocytes, it infects uh, dendritic cells, thymic epithelial cells. It reduces the number of T cells. As I'll show you, it erases your immune memory, your B cell memory, and you get enhanced infections. And so in countries where there's a lot of measles because kids are malnourished. They get secondary infections that end up killing them. Rubella also immunosuppresses by infecting lymphoid cells. And of course, HIV infects CD4 positive T cells, the cells that are needed for so many adaptive responses. So you get opportunistic infections and you get cancers as a consequence. And we'll look at that in some more detail later on. But here's an experiment that was done in 2019, which really amazed me. This is the first time that this had been done. They took serum from kids who, uh, a variety of cohorts of kids, uh, kids who had never had measles, kids who had been vaccinated against measles, and then kids who had mild or severe measles. And they took serum. So now their serum has antibodies to measles, but also to every other virus they've ever encountered, right? So they take a chip and they put on this chip peptides derived from 400 pathogenic human viruses. So you take all the proteins of a virus and you, you make peptides against all of them. You have a company make this and you put them on the chip and then you put the serum on the chip and you can measure antibodies that bind to individual peptides of each virus. And so that's what these plots are. These are, those forms are actually many, many dots corresponding to each peptide from a specific virus. And so on the left, you can see that if you have uh, mild or severe measles, so the two red uh, scatter plots, that's before and after measles. So they have samples from cohorts before and after. You can see the antibodies against all these other viruses are decreased substantially. And that's, that is expanded on the right, the, the, the whisker plot there. You can see these are the proportion of the repertoire uh, retained in these kids against the antibodies against uh, different viral peptides. And you can see these are the kids who never had measles and these are the mild and severe measles. So basically you have reduced the antibodies against many viruses in these kids. And, and that includes vaccines. The reason for this is that the virus reproduces in B cells and in particular memory B cells, and it's destroying them, so now you don't have any memory. So what do you do? Well, a kid who has measles, you have to revaccinate them against other viruses, and they have to go through and get all of the childhood infections that they had before in order to have immunity. So it's a really good reason to be immunized against measles. So you don't have your B cells wiped out, you don't have your immune memory uh, wiped out. By the way, this study was possible, it was made possible. It was done in the Netherlands where there are specific cohorts of families who do not immunize their kids. They refuse to immunize their kids. And, but they're very willing to take place in studies like this. So they let their kids uh, be bled before and after they get measles infection, right? So they're part of this study 
And they say, oh, yeah, take, here, take the baseline serum. And then, oh, my child had measles. Bring them in. You bleed it. And that's how we get these data. So I find that it's great that they want to participate. But they really should immunize their kids because, look, this is really what's happening here. All right. So next time, we are going to start talking about the two different kinds of infections we see with viruses, acute infections, the ones that uh, come and go and, and are resolved.